Hello, I'm Joe Newmeyer, film critic for New York's WOR Radio. Thank you for joining us for this four-year consideration Q&A for the film American Night. It's my honor to welcome director and writer Alessio Della Valle. Welcome, Alessio. Thanks for being with us, and congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. So great to have you here. The film's an exciting, dynamic, and sensual film in every meaning of the word. Uh, it's a noir heist drama with a totally captivating style set against the backdrop of the art world. Talk to us about the origin of the film, Alessio, and how the idea first came to you. The origin of the film is a pure travel. It's a pure trip into the world of imagination. Mm. It was all... And what if the characters did that? Mm -hmm. And what if this character, how would this character react in this situation? Yeah. And so I began with the characters mm -hmm. and for each of the characters I wrote who they are. I wrote how their house looks like, mm -hmm. what they want, what they need, mm -hmm. what, which, is, which is and was different. So what they wanted and what they needed were two different things. Right. What their flows are, and then, so I wanted, to, I wanted to create something that was not realistic per se. I mean, I wanted it to be believable, but I wanted it to be a pure trip in the world of imagination. Right. And so that was the beginning. Um, in other words, I really love movies in which uh, you sort of enter into a different world. So for two hours, you are in, a, in, a, in another land in another environment, you know, all the rules are different. So yeah, that was the beginning of it. And then what happens is when I began writing at some point, I could just close my eyes and see the two characters in the room alive and they would start talking to each other. And I was just a witness of this conversation, it's like virtual conversation in, in, uh, in, inside the world of, of imagination. Yeah. Yeah, it's very heightened in that way, which I love. It really does transport us as viewers into a into a whole other realm. And the and the art world as a backdrop is really fascinating as well. What was it about the art world and and uh, in the film, uh, without giving anything away, but uh, Andy Warhol's Pink Marilyn plays a very crucial uh, role in the film as a kind of MacGuffin. What uh, what was it about the art world that intrigued you that you wanted to set the film against the backdrop of the art world? Well, I guess. It's a combination of personal experiences and again, you know, having characters doing sort of a trip through a world of imagination. So when, when you create, I really set out not to be in this world, but to create a world that had its, its own rules. Mm. Um, for example, in, in our obviously real world, um, things happen randomly without having an explanation. However, there is not a direct connections with human morality. Like sometimes bad guys get away with things or good guys don't, right? right. In this world, the rule, one of the rules I, I created is uh, if no matter how bad the character is, if he repents, he leaves. Mm. If he doesn't repent, Maybe something else, without spoiling anything, maybe something else happens. Right. Uh, so I created a, lo a lot of rules of how the, you know, for example, in morality, how does, you know, how does morality affect the characters' lives in this world? I also wanted to have every uh, form of art in the film. So I consciously put every form of art in the film. So there's music. We are mm -hmm. stages singing a song on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, there's poetry, which is when um, um, Annabelle Belmondo, who plays Katie, mm -hmm. reads Jonathan Rhys Myers, uh, who plays John Kaplan. She reads his article on the time, mm -hmm. and which is written like sort of like an Allen Ginsberg poetry, or in the style of. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is uh, performance art, when mm -hmm. there is the scene in the street with the masks mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. You know, there, there's every form of art. Yeah. And I actually use art as an element of conflict. So every time a character wants something, uh, because it, 
on a certain level, it is a movie about the relationship between order and chaos, mm -hmm. right? So in one scene, John wants to get his girl back, his woman back, and he's willing to do it. He's willing to do what it takes. However, an element of chaos enters in, that was unexpected enters in the scene. And while he goes to a meeting, a, meet, a meeting spot in the street, there's a street art, there's a performance art event happening in the streets, which prevents him from getting her. So art sort of plays an element of chaos that, you know, flips yeah. their lives yeah. in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's, it is beautifully reflected in the film and, the, and that, that nature of chaos and the, the creative force of chaos in some ways too, for it, it, no matter who the character is, whether they're, they're good or bad, there is sort of this creativity that comes from it. And how about the, how about the cinematography and the, and the style? Because it really is such a stylish film and so beautiful. What were some of the touchstones for you about that? My working method was I was on the sets because we were shooting on a backlot, a New York City backlot. So I was on the set, and so I just thought instead of storyboarding or previews, we have the physical location, let's just get theater actors and a small camera and let's shoot the scenes. So what we did is we actually went there and we shot the scenes before with, you know, with small camera and actors before, and we cut them together. Oh, wow. So I actually had sort of shot it twice, really. Yeah, yeah. wow. So I went there and I shot it and then we cut it and so we, we, we saw you know, how, how it would work. And then on set, my working method was, I really needed to see what the shot was. So I would go there with the actual lens, with a, with a, with a case and a set of lenses and I would try every different lens that I thought until I found the right lens for each shot. And then, so I, this was like, we chose the lens and then we put the camera there. And in terms of composition, I guess, uh, I was really moving elements in each shot to make them uh, sort of perfect, you know, in my mind, so that it would look more like a, like a painting in a way. Yeah. And that also reflects, you know, uh, in every department, really, because I really was interested in to creating a new world, mm. which was believable for the audience, but like a different world. Like, for example, in costumes, I chose all the characters to always wear the same costumes, whether in realistic movies, you know, on the next day, they wear different clothes, right? Yeah. But I was really thinking of like how the characters in Clockwork Orange, for example, they're all dressed the same. Right. Um, and yet it makes it even more believable than they are. Right. And oh, um, Clint Eastwood in all the Sergio Leone's movies is always wearing the same poncho for months. Right. right. <laughs> But it's still believable. It actually makes, I can give you so many examples of characters that are wearing the same clothes. Yeah. And it makes them sort of becoming more iconic and more, it's not realistic, but they become more iconic. So I was going for pop culture and to iconize everything, mm. to make everything become more iconic, which is also why I chose a lot of iconic artworks like the Pink Melody. Mm -hmm. because it's an iconic, famous pop artwork, and yet it's based on it itself. It's based on another icon, yeah. you know, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. In some levels, it was, it was a reflection on what is iconic. Yeah. I, I love that, the, the, the sense of, of the reflection between the, the film and art and art and the film and life. I feel like that after you've seen the film, it sort of all feels like it's, it's of a piece in that way. That's really a, a beautiful description of it. And the characters who populate the film are, are great to spend time with, whether they're decent or villainous. And sometimes those traits bleed into each other. Talk to us about uh, Jonathan Reese Myers and Emil Hirsch, how you discuss their characters of John and Michael with them and what they brought to the roles. In terms of character, I began from uh, the classical noir. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, because I, just came to realize that every movie I loved it was either a noir or, or based on the rules of noirs, what they are now called neo-noirs. Right. So basically, John Kaplan is the anti-hero, and what defines the anti-hero is that he, he does the right thing for the wrong reason, or he does the wrong thing for the right reason. Right. So John, he has, um, John Kaplan, he has, um, 
he has a superpower. I mean, his superpower is he can spot a fake at a glance. Mm -hmm. However, he doesn't use this for the good. He uses this uh, talent that he has. He's one of the few people in the world that can just look at a canvas and see this is real, this is not real. But he doesn't use this in the right way. He uses to make shady deals under the table you know, in the black market. But because of Sarah, because he's in love with her, he, he decides to change his life and to repent and to open up a, uh, an art gallery and, and clean himself up. Uh, however, being a sort of a double character, there will be twists yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will come with that. And, and, and Emil Hirsch, she plays uh, Michael Rubino, who's the son of uh, the head of New York's mafia. Uh, we meet him on the day of the funeral of his father. Mm -hmm. And he always wanted to be an artist, a painter. He's a sensitive, he was a sensitive kid. Mm -hmm. But he was the son of a very interesting man <laughs> who basically forced him to follow the family business. And when we meet him, it's at the funeral and all the heads of New York's mafia meet and tell him, we wanna crown you as the new boss, but on one condition, that you give up painting. So he's faced with a, with a big question mark and with a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. And his journey is so, is so immersive in so many ways because it's, it's interesting to watch characters who, who have sort of live in that gray zone as they try and navigate the right and the wrong and the, and the black and the white. Jeremy Piven and Paz Vega are also so good in the film. Let's talk about them and their characters of Vincent and Sarah and, uh, and how Jeremy and Paz brought those characters to life. Yes. I must add that both Jonathan Rhys Myers and Emilia Hirsch have been so great. They're both incredibly talented incredibly talented actors and they gave everything they could to these characters. They worked really hard and I think they portrayed the characters in a terrific way. Um, we all knew that we were going sort of in a crazy direction, which was based on pure imagination mm -hmm. because I just thought, what if we have a character who's a son of the mafia Right, and he sh but he wants to be a painter, so he paints and then he shoots on the canvases with an AK-47. Right. <laughs> so we thought, okay, let's try something crazy, but let's make it believable for an audience, yet a trip in a different world, in a, in a sort of a surreal alternative dimension, parallel universe. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Piven plays Vincent, who is the innocent, uh, according to the classical uh, noir characters. Right. And the innocent is the character who is an innocent, he's naive, and he, has, uh, he ends up, sometimes he ends up sacrificing even his own life for the, the anti-hero. Mm -hmm. And Paz Vega, she plays what is defined as the good wife in the um, noir uh, classical characters. We did play twists on, on the classical characters of Neo Noir for, for these characters. So he's an innocent. So Jeremy Piven plays uh, Vincent, who's a standman and is the stepbrother of, of John Kaplan. How, however, he's a standman who has vertigos. So his art is very interesting because his flaw being, you know, his job being a standman with his flaw, which is he has vertigos, they create uh, a lot of interior conflict and exterior conflict for the character. Yeah, yeah. It's, they all complement, there are kind of four sides or many sides of a diamond. They really sort of all, uh, as you're looking at one, you're sort of feeling the reflection of others and all of them are, and all the performances are really, are so terrific. Lastly, I want to talk, let's hear about the editing of the film by Zach Stenberg and the production design by Francesca Fezzi. This is a movie in which art and the impact it has on our lives can drive some people to extremes, how art and chaos are combined and how even expressions of violence and thievery uh, is a form of art. Um, the editing and production design must have been so important to you, right? To kind of get those exactly right and kind of feel the, the art form within them kind of bleeding through into the film, right? Absolutely. And may I add just one thing about what you just said to the previous yeah. question? 
Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say, because you said something interesting about the characters being double. Mm. I th think no one in life, historical figures and people that we meet in life, I think no one in life is either white or black, good mm. or bad. Everyone has like a diamond, you know, with so many different shapes and, and, and facets to it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create these characters that were multidimensional. They were not just one thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, for example, for Michael Rubino, uh, played by Neil Hirsch, I wanted people to love him, and, but he's the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. And then John Kaplan, typical uh, noir characters are. So Paz Vega, she's the, the good wife, but yet when we meet her, she is breaking up with John which is the opposite of the good wife, you know, being at home, taking care of the house, of the family. First scene of her, she's crying in the car and she's breaking up with him. Yeah. So, and also in movies, when they introduce characters, they always sort of pre-cook them for the audience and pre-digest them. And then they explain who they are, what their problems are, what their goals are. Yet in life, when you meet someone, you have no idea what they did before or what they will do after, and you will never know, right? right. So I wanted to portray this. And so when we meet them, the story is already happening, like in life. They are already doing things. Yeah. I didn't want to explain, you know, sort of in a, in a simplistic way who they are. I was like, boom, they're in this moment yeah. of their life. Yeah. And that, that works with the editing too, because it really kind of brings us back and forth in moments in their of their lives and the and the the stories that that loop around each other and come back to the forefront, right? The editing really helps bring that to the to the to the uh, to the forefront. So working with Zach has been a tremendous honor, and he's really great. He it was really it was a lot of fun working with him. He has I think he's a genius. Mm -hmm. He has so many great ideas. Um, it was, we were bouncing ideas back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was really sort of like a collaborative effort in which we were both um, adding on top of each other's ideas and creating new, new ideas and keeping on having this aha, wow moment. Oh, we should really try that. And getting both really excited when this worked. Mm -hmm. very brilliant very sharp editor we i think we agreed on every choice so i think we were very much on the same page like two minds alike going in the same direction and it was a lot of fun uh working with him he had so many um ideas visual ideas uh, he, he came up with these really cool transitions uh from scenes to scenes it was a um, it was fun, but it was also very collaborative, uh, two minds conversation uh, uh, process. Yeah, well, well, he and you and your whole team do such fantastic top-notch work on the film. It is vibrant and atmospheric, a work of art in and of itself. Thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Alessio Della Valle, writer and director of American Night. Thank you, Alessio. Congratulations again on the film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.